think it's been a pretty productive day so far. A lot of uh, really interesting, great insights. Um, you know, I think as I sort of reflect a little bit, there's sort of, I guess, four categories of areas of challenges and issues that I think a lot of people have been bringing up through the course, both through the questions from the audience, which have been great. So please keep those coming because we'll try to address those a little bit later, uh, but also through the panelists. And I think sort of those four categories have been uh, culture, communication, uh, management, and hiring. Sort of, I think that's what's on top of people's minds. So we'll eventually dig into that and, and get your thoughts on that, Sid. But I think you alluded to this earlier in, uh, when we initially spoke up here that uh, you used to have an office at GitLab, but people stopped showing up. Could you just tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, for sure. So um, the first office was my house in uh, the Netherlands, and I had a spare desk, and anybody who is new to the company would like be invited. And they came on Monday, and it tends to be that Wednesday was the last day that they showed up. They didn't show up on the first day. And uh, I was always like, why aren't they here? And why didn't they tell me that they not intended to come? Like, I thought it was weird. But I thought, like, OK, well, it's about the work. They were working. Uh, I was seeing results. So I never, I never told someone, hey, you have to be, you have to be there. And then the second time was um, when we went to Y Combinator. We were all in the same house for three months, nine people, it was super intense. Um, and then Y Combinator said, okay, you plan on going all remote after this, um, but we don't recommend that. Remote works for engineers, but not for sales and marketing, so get an office. So uh, we listened, we got an office, uh, we put uh, 10 desks in there, and uh, the same thing kind of happened. I think Hayden, our salesperson from Alameda, was the first person, like, he showed up, three days, and then he didn't show up anymore. And that kind of pattern repeated. Um, it's uh, funny, like you hire like a VP of sales and they say, oh, this, this doesn't work for uh, SDRs, the people who do outbound. They're just out of college, they won't be able to do this. But by the time he came around to hiring BDRs, he was living in Sacramento, so he had a four hour commute before. So he was pretty interested in the idea of no longer having that. And then we found our BDRs in Utah, and they were great. And there was, there was no way they were going to come to San Francisco. That's really interesting. So somebody made a comment earlier that the first 50 hires you make are really, really crucial for setting the tone for culture of the organization. I'd actually be curious, how were you able to recruit people in your early days to get through that first 50 hires? What was sort of the pitch? You know, what were people either attracted to or maybe turned off a little bit by the remote nature of it? Or sort of how did you get people over the line to, to join the company? Yeah, um, I, I'm going to disagree a bit. I think culture is something you do continuously. And I think um, our culture is, is more strong and more pronounced now than it was at the time. And that's because we wrote it down, uh, because we continually um, iterate on it, but also because we reinforce it. You can find the 11 ways in which we kind of reinforce our values uh, on our values page. But the, the pitch like to join a remote company was, hey, you're going to have more time. So you're going you're gonna to not have your commute time. You're going to have more kind of um, freedom of how, to, how you distribute your day. If you want to go the, to the gym or the supermarket during the day, that's fine. And you're going to have more flexibility if there's something unforeseen that pops up. But there were also other pitches. If people were already remote, it's like you're already remote. You know how awesome it is. But this is now a company where you're not in the satellite office. You don't feel out the loop because everyone's on the same level. And to um, uh, executives, it was like, yes, I know you're skeptical of this model. That's OK. Please have a chat with our CFO who's gone through this and is now able to have quicker communication with the salespeople than he was able to do at his previous company. Interesting. So do you ever, uh, especially in the early days, did you ever run into any negative? You, you mentioned why Common Air sort of told you that this might not be a good idea. Did you ever run into that same reaction either from potential investors or customers in the earlier days? Yeah, for sure. And it was most pronounced during our B round. During the A round, we were still set on the office. During the B round, it was pretty clear that we were not going to do that. And uh, 
we had a great investor here in the Valley who was very articulate. They say, look, you check all the boxes, except for this f remote thing that you're doing, and it's just not, it's unusual. And he said, literally, I don't, I'm not saying it's not gonna work, it's just a risk that we don't have to take because we have enough deal flow to take a company that does check that box. So that was, I couldn't disagree with that, and we didn't get that investment. And there's a person here who actually managed to convince um, convince our B round investor, Argus Capital. And his name is AB. He's here in the crowd. Thanks for coming, AB. We stand up. Oh, he's meeting another founder. Always hustling. Um, so. The feedback was from Vili Ilchev. He's like, I love this company, it's great. I'm concerned about this remote thing, but what he did great is like he invited us to talk about it. So all the other investors were like thinking internally, but not inviting us to talk about it. So he invited us. I had a, a deck specifically addressing all the concerns. We were at the end of the deck, and Vili's like, yeah, that sounds nice, kind of being able to mitigate it. And then AB pounded pounded his fist on the table almost, I don't think literally, but he, he was pretty close to that. He said, look, I spent the entire night reading their handbook. This is the best run company I've ever seen. And that kind of closed the deal for us. So um, anything from customers in the earlier days, you know, sort of, you know, it's a little bit unusual and maybe they don't even actually know that you were remote in the earlier days. Did you get any feedback from them? Yeah, it's, it's remarkable. Like, customers is not a problem. Customers love when you visit them. So it's not a problem. And our, our CFO, his Zoom background now is a UPS office. It's the UPS office where GitLab is registered. So sometimes they have people kind of showing up there and asking where GitLab is. And it's like, it's all remote. There is no, there is no office. That's funny. So to double click a little bit on hiring, which I sort of mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, what's sort of the approach to identifying talent when you have effectively seven billion people in the world? Um, how do you narrow the scope and, and find and attract the right talent? You know, you can't hold a, uh, a local meetup to try and find people. What, is, what are some of the things that GitLab is doing to do that? Currently, they find us. 90% um, of the hires we make is inbound, so people that applied on our website, and uh, we get 3,000 applications every week. Um, that's not, I don't think that's healthy or good. So we're gonna go, we're gonna strive for 50-50. And doing more outbound ourselves, we'll be able to kind of attract people that make the company more uh, diverse. So we think that's a great lever. But so far, people finding us, we get a lot of people say, I read your handbook, I kind of copy pasted certain things to our organization. And then after a while, I start thinking, I might as well work at the company where they make the handbook. Right. And so, uh, especially in the earlier days of trying to scale your hiring, um, uh, were there specific things that you did to improve the hiring experience to get people uh, comfortable across the line and, and getting engaged with GitLab? Um, well, we started early. The first net promoter score we did, or uh, a satisfaction score in our case, was for the hiring experience. So we asked everyone who got declined by us what their experience was. We're striving for four that. 4.2, and we've generally been above 4.0 for that. So measuring it, right now our... That's on an out of five scale. Yeah, okay. out of five scale, yeah. <laughs> that, that'd be pretty bad. Um, and then uh, we're still working to get apply to accept to get that timing down from 40 days to 30 days. Um, I think what we look for in candidates is not so much that they can do remote, but that they are a manager of one, that they can manage their own time, that they don't need someone constantly prodding them to advance. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And um, <clears throat> one of your colleagues mentioned earlier about the salary widget that you guys have created, sort of the calculator to come up with uh, the appropriate compensation based on where somebody is in the world. Can you talk a little bit more about how you came up with the idea, where you get the data, and just tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, that was a huge undertaking. So we had people applying, and we wanted to not be paying people differently without a reason. And we do want to pay people local market salary. Like, it's not healthy for people to be above market because they will not leave your company even though they're miserable. And it's not good for people to be underpaid because 
they will leave your company even though they're, they're doing great. So a market is, is determined by the metro region you live in. There's huge differences between San Francisco and somewhere else. So we try to, f we try to get to that. And in the beginning, we were kind of thinking about like cost of living and stuff like that. But it's not about that. It's, it's about the market wage. And we found that the rent in a city is a great indicator of what the market wage is. Now, we've since progressed a bit beyond that. And uh, Brittany, who was on stage earlier, did a great job at that. Um, and we, it's a pretty simple formula, and it has six factors. One of it is the San Francisco benchmark, like what is this wage in San Francisco? One of it is the location. One of it is like what's the level of the, the job? Uh, like are you senior or junior? One of it is kind of the experience within that level. Uh, so that's a 10% higher or lower. One of it is, are you a contractor or an employee? And with those factors, we were able to kind of construct a great uh, salary, which we display on our job pages. So if you apply for a job at GitLab, at the bottom of the page should be that calculator. And since a few weeks, it also has our stock options. So you can kind of look at different scenarios and see what your stock will be worth. And do you find uh, when you take feedback from candidates that uh, didn't make it all the way through the funnel, do they mention that specifically? Is that something that you find is uh, uh, instrumental for their experience? Um, I don't think so. I think you can live without a, a calculator that is public. We just default to public. I do think it's very important that you can explain internally why you're paying people different things. Like you, you, you have people come together, they talk about their salary, and they come to, to me like, hey, why am I earning half of this other person? And you, you better have the right answer. Like, hey, they're a contractor in a high cost region, and you're living in a lower cost region, et cetera, and this is how it works. Um, on that note, uh, transparency is a key piece uh, to the GitLab culture, and, and I believe the last count I heard, your manual is now about 3,000 pages. Yes. Um, talk a little bit about some of the decisions early on that you made to, to make that one of the key values. So we started with that because we are a company that is very influential in the open source project. And what you find is that people in the open source community tend to be skeptical of the influence of the company. And making that work is essential to our success. And we thought by giving them greater insight into the company, you tend to have more compassion and more trust. And it's easier when something goes off the rail to be to quickly remedy that. Um, we also found it's a great help in hiring people, if you can tell. Like having that handbook out there is, is a great kind of promotional tool. People can opt into our culture. Like if they like how we run a company, they can opt in. And that, does, that doesn't have to be everyone because there's, there's many more people than can ever work at GitLab. So uh, that's been a, a great other reason to do it. And it's for us, transparency is not something we do because it's necessarily always the most pragmatic thing, but it's something we do because it's in our top three values. Are there any things, are, are there certain topics or things you won't be transparent about? Yeah, there's a list of that too. So if you Google GitLab non, not public, you'll find a list of 15 things, um, all the way from like non-audited financial results to partnerships with other companies. Got it. Um, so, You've talked a lot about, in the past, uh, communication internally and using tools like Zoom and Slack. Um, are there any tools that you have in GitLab that you wouldn't be able to do business without? Yeah, I think Zoom and Slack are good. Um, I think Google Docs, we use it for meetings, and we, have a, we make sure there is an agenda for every meeting. It's editable by everyone. It has the questions. You type the question in the meeting doc before you even ask it. And people are taking notes real time of the meeting. And it, it's, it's made our meetings much more focused and efficient. And also, if, you're, if there's some people who couldn't attend the meeting, they have much better notes of what the meeting was about. Uh, so I think it's not just Google Docs. It's not just a tool. It's also how you use the tool. And we got a lot of documentation of how you use certain things. So uh, on the communication front, one of the challenges you might run into with a distributed or remote workforce is uh, different cultures and, and views of the world based on where you live. And uh, recently, uh, there's been some reports about um, how you deal with political banter at GitLab. Can you talk a little bit about 
um, you know, why that has been a challenge, if it has been, and, and some of the decisions you made as, as the CEO uh, around that. Yeah, we, uh, we have a policy of not bringing up political subjects in the workplace. And I, uh, I think it's, it's the default for a lot of companies, but you see that here on the West Coast, uh, especially like in San Francisco, it's, it's um, getting more prevalent to bring things up. So we're kind of, we're struggling to kind of rhyme the two things. On one hand, we do want to kind of talk about things that are important internally. On the other hand, we don't want to alienate people. Um, so I think it's hard. I think we have a lot of, a significant portion of the people who work at our company are Republicans. Um, and we don't want to alienate those people. At the same time, there's things happening that, that we're not, that I can imagine a lot of people in the company, including myself, are not super happy about. So it's, it's a very tough trade-off. And I hope that there were simple solutions to it. And I'm figuring out that there's not, there's any, not any clear-cut ways to, to do that. How early in the organization life did you establish the no politics? Uh, was that you know, from the start or? It was basically when I came to the US and I realized that was the kind of happening in a lot of companies already. For our people in Europe, that was something that was not, like if you, if you work in the US, you know not to bring up political things most of the time, unless you're kind of aware of what the vibe is of the rest of the people. For the people in Europe, that wasn't obvious, and that was creating a lot of confusion. So we, we try to make like these implicit things explicit so that everyone is aware, even if they come from a totally different culture. That's really interesting. So uh, one of the questions that we actually got from a number of people, uh, we, we asked a, a few people when they signed up, you know, what sort of some of the challenges were. Uh, I think people did struggle with the level of transparency. Do you think you can still get an all remote organization to work without a high level of transparency? I think it's very hard. Um, obviously, you don't have to be public about things. Like, we're public about everything. I don't think that's necessary. Uh, it's something we do, but others don't. I do think that remote is mostly about working asynchronously. You can't, you can't shoulder tap as easily, you can't ask as easily. So you do have to make sure materials are available. And you cannot wait for something to sh someone to share something with you. And if that's the case, you have to share things with more people than you'd normally do. So I, I do think an increased amount of transparency is a necessity for working asynchronously and remote. Sense. So, shifting gears to talk a little bit about culture, um, and you and you mentioned at the beginning that culture is something that you're constantly working on, and it sort of feeds on itself. And your culture today is stronger than when you started the business. Uh, talk us through a little bit about why that's the case, and some of the things that you do to foster culture. Yeah, um, I think it's it's the case both because our values are better defined, like. If you, if you Google GitLab values, you'll see that there's a lot of thinking that went into that, and there's a lot of examples. When we started the culture, all of that was, we weren't, <laughs> at some point we had 13 values, and uh, nobody could name more than three. Uh, so I think that's a lot better now. And there's also like more ways in which we reinforce them, and we have 11 ways right now. And examples are every promotion is linked to our values. Every hire is linked to our values. And in, a, in, a, in case of a promotion, publicly for the whole company to see. Um, but there's also a thing like we have a thank you channel. And when people thank someone, you can add emojis for the values that kind of apply to that. And that's input for like a value award we give later during our uh, global get together. And do you do anything face-to-face? -face? And I, a couple people highlighted earlier that it is still important, despite people working all over the globe, that you do get FaceTime. Uh, do you do anything to, to uh, encourage that? Yeah, once a, uh, once a year, or once every nine to 12 months, we come together uh, as a company. It's about 85% attendance. And we spend our time not on Dev by PowerPoint with presentations, but half of the time we go on excursions together and half of the time we have an unconference where people bring up subjects they wanna talk about and 
uh, informal setting of 15 people. Great. So got a really good question here from the crowd. I think that there's been a number of conversations on the stage over the course of the day today around how do you ensure that people are contributing and ensure productivity. This is actually the flip side of that is with fully remote teams, how do you ensure people don't get burnt out? Um, you know, are there things that you can do to manage and, and uh, assess that? Yeah, it's super hard. Um, it's a few things. So for example, at GitLab, managers are not allowed to ask about how long you're working except if they suspect that you're working kind of too long hours. Um, it's also important to kind of have that, have her be open about mental health and have that conversation and have, um, make sure that that's a kind of a topic that can be discussed. Um, we also wanna make sure that <laughs> we recently edited the handbook to say, look, if you're not taking vacation, you're you're not a very good collaborator because apparently you're not able to transfer your job to anybody else. You're not able to define it well. Um, so we try to shame people into taking vacation. <laughs> I took three weeks off this summer. I took, last week I took first day, uh, half the day off and Friday the whole day. Like we try to get lead by example as an executive team. Uh, now, of course, like preventing burnout is not just about hours. You can burn out working very few hours um, so it's also important that when managers see someone's productivity declining, they have an open conversation. It could be due to them not working hard enough, but almost in every case, it's due to something else. And um, cultural norms around vacation vary a lot uh, across companies. And um, you know, how do you enforce or encourage people that when they're actually taking vacation, you're on vacation? Are there certain things that you do in terms of either you know, forcing people to put up email responses, anything along those lines? We don't, and it's a thing I struggle with. Uh, I had a, I have one report, Emily Chirillo, and she's now, she calls it as a half a vacation, so she's not doing her regular things, but she's joining meetings she finds interesting. She's still on Slack, but she's also like reading a ton of books and doing other things, and I think there's a huge, we want managers of one, and we better treat people like managers of one. So for example, at GitLab, in a meeting, it's okay to not pay attention. And if someone has to repeat a question because you weren't paying attention, that's not a shameful thing. That's totally okay, we'll repeat the question. You're the boss of your own time. You better manage it well. And if that part of the meeting isn't, doesn't seem interesting to you, it's okay to the email or even Facebook on the side. It's okay, turn your camera on, it's totally fine to look the other way. I think with vacations, it's the same thing. Like people should be in control of that. I think it'd be a problem if people get kind of pinged or demanded upon by colleagues while they weren't into that. And I've not seen that happening yet. Do you find yourself relying heavily on, I guess for lack of a better way to put it, quantitative metrics of productivity? Um, you know, code commits or whatever that might be for engineers. Uh, if so, how do you kind of think about that for a little bit harder to quantify roles, human resources and some of those? Yeah, for sure. Um, we rely a lot of metrics. And metrics might not tell you what the problem is, but they certainly can tell you where a problem, where there might be a problem. And for engineers, it's merge requests per month for marketing, it's MQLs, SQLs, activity. For community, it's uh, average response time, uh, sentiment. So there's metrics possible for everything. And if you wanna have an idea, you can Google GitLab KPI index, and it shows like the 50 metrics for every one of our departments. I think there's over 100 metrics on that page, and some of them have public embedded uh, graphs, so you can check them out. Great, I'm just looking at some of the questions at the audience, and just a reminder, uh, if you want to submit questions, uh, Slido, um, you've got some good ones here though. So one of them is, uh, how have you solved the time zone issue? It's unsolvable, it's the bane of our existence. Um, asynchronous, a, working asynchronous is the only thing you can do. So write things down, record it, if you Google uh, GitLab unfiltered, you'll find a YouTube channel with like a ton of videos. And right now our biggest thing, problem is that we can only live stream one meeting at a time. So we're gonna create a bunch of extra channels. Um, 
write things down, work in issue trackers. It's also about taking stuff out of Slack if you can, because the Slack conversation kind of moves on and then people in other time zones are left. Uh, also not have too many meetings, like try to do things asynchronously. Uh, for example, there's a key meeting for sales and they did it asynchronously this, uh, this month. Um, so I think that's the only thing that can fight it. It's still, it's still not great. The experience for GitLab and pe people, for people in Asia Pacific is not as great as for the people in America and Europe. And as you guys continue to scale, do you think that that will become more challenging or less challenging? No, I think I think it will be the same, and I think we'll get even slightly better at working asynchronously. Uh, great question just came in, actually. That's related to what we were talking about previously. What do you do if an employee on vacation is not checking their email, and you might lose a customer because of that? Is that something that you've run into, or how would you deal with a problem like that? Yeah. I've not seen that problem happening. And in, for example, if it's a customer thing, like we try to work in issue trackers. Uh, we, our salespeople keep the notes in Salesforce. Like we try to document things. So, so there should no be nobody who's like omissable. And, um, but it's OK. Like it's, if, if it's something really dire, yeah, do, do send them a text. Got it. So, uh, you mentioned that when you moved here, it was about nine employees at GitLab when you moved to San Francisco? Yes. And today you're approaching about 1,000, so it's about a, over 100x growth in the last four or five years. Four years, yeah. So that has to pose a lot of challenges for you. What, what would you say are the biggest challenges you're facing today at scale? It's been remarkably good. Um, I think some of the things we're focused on improving, one thing I mentioned is doing more outbound recruiting. Um, that will allow us to bring more gender diversity into the company. Um, another thing, what we'd love to do is have more opportunities for juniors, so like internships, apprenticeships, which we don't have yet. Um, and one thing I'm super worried about, but that's not happening, is that us lowering the hiring bar because we want to uh, recruit a person for that uh, for that function, but actually over time it's kind of gone up. Oh, that's great. Um, <clears throat> so any advice? So we've had a lot. I've talked to quite a few people in the crowd today, and I think a lot of them are earlier stage founders who are thinking about going fully remote. Any particular advice you would give them, you know, from the earliest stages that they should be focused on? I think the hardest thing at GitLab has been a handbook first culture. And that is like, if you want to make a change at the company, if you want to change something, you change it in the handbook first and then you communicate it. And that's allowed us to kind of have a li living, breathing handbook that, that's so essential to that success. And that's, that's not intuitive. That will not happen naturally. That will not happen because you wrote down that it has to happen. That takes kind of constant reminding, like, hey, that's great that you're making that change, but it should be in the handbook before you communicate it. Uh, that's the thing I've been focusing on very early, and I think it's just something really hard to get back if you're bigger. So uh, we're coming on time here, but the, the last thing I want to ask is, you know, we're sitting here five years from now, and, and you're looking back on, on the journey of GitLab. What would you hope happens uh, over the next five years that you would call a success for the company? Yeah, so we have publicly documented goals for November 18, 2023, and those include, for example, being at a billion dollars of revenue, but also um, that uh, our top 10 performance should say that GitLab has the best people in their team with a satisfaction score of 4.2. Um, they're all public, so Google GitLab sequence strategy if you're interested. Um, but I also hope that when we sit here five years from now, that all remote is a bigger part of the legacy of GitLab than the company itself. I think all remote has, a, a, has the potential to transform the world and spread um, opportunity more equally. And I'm, I'm super excited to see that. And um, just so uh, people in the audience know, uh, where can they find the GitLab uh, handbook? Google GitLab handbook or Google GitLab all remote, because uh, Darren has done an amazing job like writing up a lot of the lessons. Great. 
All right, well, we're at, we're at time. Thank you guys very much for coming. Um, and I want to especially thank uh, our teams from General Catalyst, in particular Rhonda, for helping put this together, as well as the team from GitLab, uh, Darren and, and other folks. Uh, this was uh, an amazing endeavor, and um, I hope you audience, you took a lot away from this. Um, there's a lot more to come. This has become such an interesting burgeoning topic. Um, you know, we're going to see a lot more along the lines of blog posts and a whole variety of information. I think this is a great starting point for everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Kyle.